Let's turn now to our Nick Schifrin, who's in Munich for the annual security conference. Nick, so how did this news about Alexei Navalny land in Munich? Amna, it was a real shockwave. That is the best way to describe this. I was with the congressmen and women uh, and their staffs uh, as this news came in, and it was really received with horror uh, that quickly became grief, uh, mixed with a lot of doubt uh, about, the, about whether this was actually true. Many of them have worked with Navalny and his staff for many years, uh, and many of them quickly started putting together statements that would blame Putin, that would blame the Kremlin, uh, even though there's no official confirmation. It also instantly changed the conversation. Uh, as you know, Amna, a lot of the conversation coming into this conference was about former President Donald Trump and his comments about NATO. It was about the U.S. failure to be able to deliver from Congress uh, absolutely vital military aid to Ukraine that it needs in the next few weeks. And instantly, the conversation became instead about Russia and Putin. So, Nick, as you say, much of that conversation focused on former President Trump and on Ukraine before the news out of Russia. But what about the conversation about former President Trump and NATO and Ukraine? Where was that today? Yeah, still very, very much going through the halls uh, of this uh, international security conference. And perhaps it's no surprise that at an international security conference, most of the audience uh, believes in international security cooperation. Uh, so perhaps Vice President Kamala Harris earlier today was playing to the crowd uh, when she suggested former President Donald Trump, whose name she did not actually use, uh, was the outlier for suggesting that the U.S. should not defend countries that do not meet that 2 percent GDP threshold of defense spending. However, there are some in the United States who disagree. They suggest it is in the best interest of the American people to isolate ourselves from the world. Let me be clear. That worldview is dangerous, destabilizing, and indeed short-sighted. One of the attendees here is Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kalas. I asked her earlier tonight uh, to first respond to the news about Alexei Navalny. Putin's playbook hasn't changed. I mean, we have seen a long list of political competitors that he has eliminated. So uh, this is not a surprise, uh, considering that he has been torturing Navalny for years already. This is the way dictators work. I mean, in dictator's handbook, what do you do? You uh, eliminate all the alternatives so that, you know, the cronies around you, when they see that you're going to the wrong direction, they have nowhere to turn to because there's no alternative. Was Navalny murdered? Well, I can't say that uh, because we don't know. I mean, we don't see, but it's clearly that uh, the intention of, you know, the poisoning that took place uh, some time ago, uh, the imprisonment and, and the way he was treated there, I mean, he was not treated well. This week, the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service released a new assessment uh, that says Russia is preparing for a military confrontation with the West within the next decade. What is that based on uh, and can it be prevented? It can be prevented if we invest in our defense, because if you think about the aggressor, uh, the aggressor takes the step of attacking somebody when he thinks that he can win because the other side is weaker. So we haven't taken, uh, taken the defense seriously enough, and that means all the NATO allies have to do more. We've been focusing on Europe, but I want to ask about the U.S. Is the United States a reliable partner? Of course, uh, all these uh, these uh, statements uh, from the uh, United States are making us uh, worried uh, because the uh, United States has been the biggest ally. And, uh, I mean, the only time Article 5 has been used is when U.S. called us. So um, uh, this is something that we need to do together. I mean, when you have aggression p uh, that pays off some part in the world, it will invite other aggressors in the world to start wars uh, elsewhere. Does Europe need to assume that the United States cannot defend Europe and cannot provide perhaps Europe in a nuclear umbrella anymore? 
Uh, I don't think so. We have, uh, you know, the agreements in place in NATO, uh, uh, all the structures in place. What we definitely have to do ourselves is to do more, like I said before. But, um, I mean, the United States has been a reliable partner and, of course, uh, we hope that it's going to be in the future as you, well. You say we hope. Uh, former President Trump, of course, uh, has said twice now uh, in the last week or so that uh, perhaps the U.S. should not defend NATO allies that do not meet that 2% GDP threshold. Uh, perhaps the U.S. Congress can restrain a future President Trump from leaving NATO, but isn't the damage already done? I mean, isn't the damage to Article 5, the doubt that is being sown here, that the U.S. wouldn't come to NATO's allies? It has been a wake-up call for many European countries that haven't done enough. And I think that is a positive thing if they start to do more. Uh, but of course, uh, statements like this, um, we are uh, watching them um, and, and uh, you know, trying to figure out. But this is uh, not a surprise. I mean, President um, uh, presidential candidate Trump, when he was president, he had the same ideas. But uh, what I want to say is that over 60 percent of uh, uh, American experts go yeah. to Europe, not to Asia, but to Europe. So it is actually to the benefit of uh, your people, your jobs, your <laughs> employment, uh, your uh, um, I mean prosperity, um, that we are so, I mean, really tied to each other. So if something happens in Europe, that has a very clear effect on American economy. The U.S. House of Representatives so far has not accepted sending more military aid to Ukraine. Uh, in eastern Ukraine, we're already seeing Avdivka uh, about to fall to Russia because of a shortage that already exists for Ukrainian uh, weapons. Uh, and there's also worries that without this military aid, Ukraine will run short of air defense just in the next few months. Uh, some I talked to are worried that Ukraine will lose the war if the U.S. House does not send that money. Do you share that concern? <clears throat> Definitely, we have to help Ukraine and we have to help them more. I mean, uh, because they are defending their country. Uh, if you think about the countries in the Ramstein coalition that are supporting Ukraine militarily, so the combined defense budgets of uh, the Ramstein coalition are 13 times bigger than that of uh, Russia's heavily inflated one. But without so, the U.S., doesn't that number change dramatically? But actually, uh, actually, Europe has done more than U.S., but of course, America has a very, very important share there. So, so um, it is something that we have actually calculated if all the Ramstein coalition countries would commit to 0.25 percent of their GDP in military aid to Ukraine uh, this breaking point for the war could be there but finally you know Ukraine has been sent more than 80 billion dollars of military aid from the West this past year it did not achieve even its lowest goals for the counteroffensive what can it achieve with more military aid even if the house releases it that it hasn't already uh, well, uh, if they have long-distance weapons, if they have real weapons to defend themselves, uh, then they can push back Russia as well. So, so the breaking point in, in all these elements could be actually uh, much nearer. But of course, um, I mean, we can't also say that let's just walk away and say that, OK, you get this territory and the aggression pays off. If aggression pays off, it serves as an invitation to use it elsewhere. And then we will wake up in much more dangerous world. So how do you see this war ending? Uh, I see this war ending with uh, Russia going back to Russia. That is actually very, very simple and easy. Prime Minister Kaya thank you very much. Thank you.